All right, so we already have questions that have been sent in by fans. Of course, anyone who's watching now, please feel free to send in any questions you may have. And other than that, we're just gonna talk about all things and everything. Okay, okay. If that sounds, if that sounds good to you. Not a so of course, like the first thing I wanna talk about. So the Orlando Magic taking on the Charlotte Hornets tonight, which I think is a little befitting to seeing as your first time playing for the Magic was you traveling to Charlotte. Yeah. So I felt like that was kind of the perfect way to start. And with that being said, what was your favorite moment during your time with the Magic? Uh, the, actually, my whole time there. My whole time in Orlando from day one when I arrived, uh, the coach, the players, the staff, the front office, and, of course, all the fans in the city, just, they welcomed me with open arms. And, um, and we, it, it made my adjustment in my trade uh, it's so easy. Uh, you know, to adjust to, and, 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 you know, it allowed me to go on and, and do, play my role and do my part, you know, to help the team succeed, and, and it was just wonderful, like, you know, it, it, so many years has passed since then, but it still sticks with me every day, just my, my, my short time there. Yeah, I want to get your two cents on Steve Clifford, because I know you guys have spent quite a bit of time together. He was not only a coach of yours oh. in Orlando, but in Houston as well. And I know he's quite fond of you, considering how well you are as a def well, how well you were at defending and him being a defensive minded coach. So what were just some moments or like memories that you have or just anything you could say about Steve Clifford? Well, Steve, Steve Clifford, Coach Clifford is one of the greatest guys I've ever encountered in my time in basketball. Uh, him and I developed a, a great relationship because he was my assistant coach with Houston, and he he he's one of the few coaches that made me uh, not in, enjoy an off season uh, by going home, going back to you know New York City, or flying and taking vacations. Steve Steve had me stay stay in a uh, Stay in Houston and keep working on my game. My jump shot all summer long. Keep working. My, uh, he he helped me stay in tip top condition. When I got traded to Orlando, we we picked right up where I left off, and, and you know we were back at it again. Just get, get I was able to get in the gym with him every morning, an hour before practice. Work, put up a lot of jump shots. Stay uh, an hour after everyone left and, and put up more shots. Uh, and we always sat down together, uh, look at a few, look at you know some short film and. You know, just to get myself ready for the next battle, and and uh, it was wonderful to see when he uh, became a head, became a head coach. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. You know, Steve has been a long time assistant on multiple teams, and uh, he just fits right into being a head coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's definitely someone who puts in the hours. That's for sure. I know he's usually always one of the first people in the building and out of the building, <laughs> even yeah. to this day. Yeah, even when, when he, and that was the the craziest part about when he was a, my assistant coach is that. He was one of the first guys in the building and the last to leave. And I was like, man, this guy must – I thought he spent the night in the, the arena. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. Who knows? <laughs> he maybe did. <laughs> I have to ask, just looking at your background, you have a lot of trophies behind you. And I know <laughs> that you kind of went through them because I listened to the mm -hmm. podcast you did with Dante and George, and they were talking about the trophies. But now that we can visually see them, I need you to break it down for us. Yeah, all my uh, – like – Youth team, my sixth, seventh grade kids. This is all the shows they win first, second place. They travel. It's just, it's, it's kind of ironic. We just came back from Florida. We played in Deerfield Beach, Fort Lauderdale this past weekend, and we, we lost to the semifinals. But you know, they, they've been racking up trophies since they went third grade. I, ha I kept at least six or seven of them. They've been with me since third grade. And uh, even when I was doing some scout work for the NBA, I was still coaching these young kids. And it's just been, it's just been a great uh, opportunity for me and and, and them. You know, obviously, for them to have a guy that played in the NBA coaching them, for me to continue to work with guys and show them and teach them all the things that I've learned throughout my travels in basketball. And it's been a thrill for these young kids to pick this stuff up at, at such a, a young age. What have you seen now being on the reverse side of things, being older now, having gone through the league and now having kids of your own who are playing? What have you seen as maybe some of the biggest differences? Because I know you came up playing street ball. That's what you're known for. That's where you got your start. And obviously your kids are probably not having the same experiences as you, but what are you seeing them go through that's maybe different for you that you're now trying to overcome as well? Uh, the biggest difference a lot of this is there's not enough basketball. Uh, you know, obviously I played uh, tons of basketball. You know, I played, I'm growing up in New York City, basketball's king. So I played so much basketball. 
And I think that's what's missing now for these kids. They're not actually playing enough to where they can uh, uh, go through adversity by themselves. You know, mm -hmm. so, for instance, when I played, there's things that I had to work on and I struggled with, but I had, I got a chance to work You have more more young kids going uh, going to the gym with a, with, with a specific trainer and working on certain things, you know, and they're not getting enough five on five, enough three on threes, four on fours, you know, stuff that make you has to force you to work on your weaknesses every single day, you know, and that's one thing I got, you know, when we, we were coming up, I got a chance to see different defenses defenses every single day I played ball, you know, guys would trap me, guys would. Uh, uh, deny me the ball, guys would press me. So therefore, I was able to go through it on the playground. So by the time I got a chance to play organized basketball, whenever the, whenever games and tournaments came about, nothing shocked me. And one thing I noticed about a lot of these kids, wherever I go, is that everything that's thrown at them shocks them out there. It's mm -hmm. like so, it they need to play more basketball uh, on top of them working out with their trainers. That's actually very good advice. I feel like especially because you see these guys that come into the league are so young. Like I know for yeah. you, when you were talking about when you came into the league, you had vets. You had guys who were way older. And now you look at a team guys, I, like I, the Matt. That, no. that, that was a key for me when I came into the league is that on, I, I got drafted in 1998 to the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, these were guys on my team that I was actually a young kid watching in college. And I got a chance to, you know, be on the same team as those guys. So, you know, not only was we, we were able to learn how to be a professional, how to uh, utilize our time and, and uh, work ethic, we also had a chance to uh, grow and mature as men because we had men guiding and leading us. Uh, you know, I tip my hats to these guys today that their veteran is a 22-year-old young man. And those men are, uh, uh, these kids are maturing at such a young age and, and fast and quick that they're able to continue to be a veteran for the next young guy who might be their age, uh, if not older. You know, you mm -hmm. got guys coming as freshmen, uh, and they're having to lead the guy that's about to get drafted as a senior. You know, so if you come, if you leave school as a freshman, you're 20 years old, and the guy that's coming out as a freshman, I mean, as a senior, he's about to be 22, 23, and you're, their veteran is this kid that's, you know, that, that is in his third year from, from you know, leaving the college as a freshman. And, and so it's just different. You know, like I said, when I was coming in the league, it was, I mean, my veterans was 33, 34 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, guys that have been in, that won NBA championships, guys that have been in the NBA war, and they prepped me for when my time was going to come to be a starter. That, you know, it, it didn't it didn't surprise me, and, and, and I was ready to hit the ground running, when, you know, to, to lead the team to the playoffs. And, you know, like you said, like in Orlando, we were able to get to the finals. <laughs> I feel like this conversation that we're having right now perfectly leads into one of the fan questions that was asked. And they wanted to know, what do you think of the Magic's young guys currently, and more specifically, Cole Anthony? Oh, I, I love the young guys. And, and, and the good thing about Cole is he, he's going to learn, you know, the pro game. You know, he, he, remember, he's only two years removed from high school basketball. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot of adjustment to do, make for the pro game. But for him, it's going to be, it's not going to be a, a long adjustment. It's, 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 it's understanding, you know, the role is different being the lead guard in high school and college than being in the NBA. Uh, the first thing for him is to learn how to win. You know, I think he has the skill set. I mean, obviously, you know, he wouldn't have been drafted so high if he didn't. Uh, and so the, so the, 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 the magic organization believes in his ability to, to, to lead and get it done. He just has to you know, understand what it is to win and lead a team and, and you're leading men. Uh, it's different. You know, it's a little easier in high school. You're leading young teenagers. But now you're, you're leading men uh, in the NBA war. So I think that's the, that's the main thing that Cole, I want to see in Cole, and, and is that learn how to win. And once you learn how to win that league, I think the stats and the accolades, all that have just come, you know, come with it. Mm -hmm. I see a question someone just asked. Mike Buckets wants to know, will there ever be a mixtape reunion? Uh, we're trying to. It, it definitely may be. We're trying to get all the and one guys, street ball guys back together. A lot of us stay in contact with each other. So, therefore, we're trying to figure out the best way to go about it. But here's one thing that we, we, will, we will not be out. We will not go out there and play. <laughs> we're too old for that. <laughs> I was going to say, are you still hooping? Nah, I just look like I'm in the shade, but no. <laughs>
<laughs> That's fair. That's fair. One question. This was the probably the most asked question okay. in terms of everything that was said that were sent in is would you slap Eddie House again? Oh no. No, actually I wanna give my, I wanna give Eddie House a hug, uh take him to dinner, apologize again and again, uh, as I have in the past. Uh, you know, it one of my dumbest mistakes I've had as a magic besides some of my careless turnovers that I may have had during the, during my run there, but that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I've ever had as a magic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair response. Putting out the apology. I respect it. I respect it. Um, so people also want to know, toughest defender in the NBA that you went against and why? Toughest defender? Mm hmm Ooh, it's tough, man. I got to think back. Uh... I know. You got a couple years under your belt. Yeah, There's a lot of people to think. <laughs> it's tough. To, who's the toughest defender from the guard standpoint? You know, mm. You know, one guy's a good defender. Uh, I would Rondo was, was a good defender, but it's, it's, it it varies from game to game. Yeah. It, we, you get a chance to learn. Even if a guy's a good defender, we get a chance to learn what he does good on defense and what he's struggling with, and we'll make him defend his uh, his struggles, uh, his weakness on defense on defense. So. You know, I never had to have a guy like Bruce Bowen guard me and those guys because they weren't point guards. So, you know, and most of the point guards that I faced were dynamite uh, offensive guys, and they weren't some of the greatest defenders. They were good defenders, but they weren't the greatest of them defenders because they spent so much time on the offensive end. That's a fair question. That's a fair question. Someone wants to know also um, – if you had to pick a starting five, who would you pick? And you have to stick to only Orlando Magic players. Starting five, wow. Um, Penny Hardaway. Of course. Tracy McGrady. Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, Dennis Scott. Um, I would throw Dwight in there, but I already have Shaquille O'Neal down there. So, um, um uh, but I, 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 I'll I throw uh, Shaquille O'Neal in. I mean, uh, uh, um, Dwight Howard there, too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, those are some of the biggest names to come out of the Orlando Magic, right? You have to. And I get in, in my guy come off the bench to help run the team. One of my favorite Magic players before I even got in the NBA, and he was playing when I was in the NBA. He was, he was beloved by all the Magic guys. Is uh Dow Armstrong. Uh, I'll throw Dow in there for a point guard. And I, I left off, I left off uh, uh, Nick Anderson. One of my favorites. Yeah, so when asked about that, they were like, what about Nick? Yeah, I, mean, I love Nick. But, I mean, when you think about these guys, those other guys, uh, I mean, they, they, they're, they're big-time names when it comes. Nick was definitely on my list, but, you know, um, I had to round the team off a little bit there. But I love Nick, even to this day, I love Nick. Yeah. I know that your time with the Magic was short in comparison to your time with the league, but mm -hmm. in terms of someone and someone saying Turkaloo, I was actually going to ask it. about your relationship well, with Hito. Do you have any funny stories or moments that you guys shared? Man, there's so many funny stories. Uh, one of the funny stories was Anthony Johnson, uh, he had a, a red uh, Ferrari. But so it was 2009, and the Ferrari looked like it was like, 1990 uh, Ferrari. So we every time he drove it, we called him Magnum P.I. You remember Magnum P.I.? So we always, yeah. always told him, we, we, we thought he had the Magnum P.I. <laughs> Ferrari. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, uh, we always call him Magnum P.I. because it's Ferrari. Uh, it's just so many different stories that we had. Man. Um, with, with Dwight always cracking jokes, pulling, pulling pranks in the locker room on coach, getting coach upset before a game or during shooting around. Uh, so we, we've had quite a lot of quite, quite a bit of stories. Man. I bet <laughs> uh, he's I mean, a good personality. Time, he's such time, a great personality. Turkey Blue and I was in the uh, uh, the sushi restaurant. I forget the name of down downtown uh, Orlando. It was one of the best sushi places. Um, and we were debating on who should pay the bill, and we both just walked outside, and the guy had to come get us. And we it looked like it, it, the funniest part about the story is like two NBA guys. Millionaires walking outside on the bill. We have to turn back around and give this guy a credit card. Like <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I see a lot of people on here. We have people watching from France. Hello. Hi, uh, from France. Hi, everybody on Everybody, France, Brazil, different countries. I see a few different countries watching. Man. Hello to everybody. Everybody in the United States across the United States watching. 
Yeah, love it. And I also just want to remind everyone that this virtual happy hour is presented by McUltra and you can get $5 off your order at drizzly.com by using the code ultra magic. So make sure you guys do that, especially ahead of our game tonight as the Orlando Magic get ready to take on the Hornets. Countdown is on to the end of the regular season, which is crazy. How much do you still follow the NBA like in season? Every day. Every day. Basketball, of course. Basketball's in my blood. Uh, I'm a basketball lifer. Uh, <laughs> so I follow it. And, you know, it, it's good for me. Uh, I have dreams and aspirations to get back in the NBA uh, assistant coach at some point. Uh, it's good to learn some things while I'm watching to share with the youth, you know, as they go along because the game has evolved. Uh, so, you know, I, I, you have to watch it every day so that you can show and teach the youth. I love it. So, okay. What should, would you like to see tonight in the Orlando Magic Charlotte Hornets game? Uh, tonight, I'd like to see the Magic continue to one. I want to see them win. <laughs> Nothing against the Charlotte. Yes. <laughs> I'm not a root for the teams I played for, uh, but I'd love to see them win and keep developing uh, their game. And 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 and, and it, you use it to get better. Uh, the young the young guys uh, continue to get better, even though you come down to the, the last leg of the season. And, you know, that's it. Just keep finding ways to get better, improve your game, going into the summer and going into the next season. I like it. Rob Sweeney, because I know a lot of people know the origin story of this, but since he's asking, for those who are unfamiliar, he wants to know, how did you get the nickname Skip to My Lou? Well, Skip to My Lou came about when I was young, playing in, uh, in Rucker Park in New York City, one of the most famous basketball tournaments, the summer tournaments in New York City. Uh, one day I thought about what I could do to get the crowd off their feet. And I said, you know what? It came to my mind. This is, and I, it all happened during the game. Uh, I said to myself, when I get a fast break, I'm going to come down on three-on-one fast break. I'm going I'm to let the ball bounce. I put a little spin on the ball while the ball is, like, still beside me. And I was skipping. I was making the defender think I wasn't paying attention anymore to the ball. And he ended up going for the ball. I caught it and wrapped it behind my back and threw it to my teammate with a no-look. He just caught it and stride and dunked it. And that was the uh, evolution of skits in my look. It was the evolution that the guy, the commentator on the mic, which name, his name was, uh, he didn't even, they didn't have a nickname. One was Duke Tango, one was Al Cash. So they called themselves Tango and Cash on the microphone. And uh, they, they, they got off their feet. It was like, ladies and gentlemen, we have a new nickname for him. That skips to my loop. So I had no idea. I was young. I was about, uh, I want to say 16 years old. And or 15, 15 or 16. I had no idea that this nickname was sticking me for the rest of my life. I, I had no idea. <laughs> How much have you enjoyed having a nickname? Because not everyone does. Right. Oh, no, it's phenomenal. Look, most people, uh, that's all I hear. They call me Skip all the time. It was a long stretch in my life that I didn't hear my, my first name. I didn't hear rape. I haven't heard rape in so long. <laughs> <laughs> but all I hear is Skip, Skip, Skip. So even the coaches call me Skip. You know, even my coach, even Van, Jeff Van Gundy, uh, uh, Coach Clifford, everyone called me Skip. That's so crazy. I love it, though. It's definitely unique, I feel like, especially coming into this league. And I know you talked about this on Pod Squad, which, by the way, guys, if you haven't listened to that episode, you guys should definitely go back and listen. There's so many, like, good gems, and you guys really dive deep into, like, your story going through from street ball all the way to the NBA and everything that you had to overcome. So I definitely recommend to go listen to that. But I was, like, the thing that I was really appreciating you were talking about is that you were saying that everyone who comes into the league – at some point was the star of their team. And then you get to the NBA and you get humbled in a sense because you're no longer the best. Right, you're no longer the number one guy. You know, I had to, I'll give you something for me. I got drafted, you know, I was the man, you know, when I did play in high school, I was the man all over the streets in every tournament. I was the man in junior college. I was the, one of the top guys when I went to Fresno State. And when I got to the NBA, man, I was like the 15th man on the team. The nights where I got D. MPs, so for all of y'all that's watching DMPs did not play. I had so many nights, and it was so frustrating because here I am for the first time in my life dealing with my so-called uh, adversity and rejection, you know, with, um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes for some players, people don't understand, sometimes even as tough individual men that we are in tough players, we start to feel like, oh, man, am I good enough to play? Uh you know, but it, it humbles you. You keep working. And I realized it wasn't that I couldn't play. It was just that I had some tough veterans that the coach believed in. These guys have been in the league for years. They know how to win. They know how to, they know how to be professional. And I had to learn that. Uh, 
Then you, got, then you got some rookies, they come in right away and they're hitting the ground running. Uh, they're playing, they're going through their ups and downs, they're fighting through the state, they're fighting through the long grind of the season. And, you know, they, they you know, everyone's situation is different. Uh, you know, but it, you got to learn how to remain in that league. And I, you know, it's best, one thing about NBA is about finding your niche. You know, it's just, that's how you last in that league. That's actually very good advice. It's because I feel like some people are like, Sometimes you see people who come in and they try to like replicate their game because it's like, well, I grew up watching so and so, so that's who I want to be like, as opposed to trying to kind of blaze their own trail to be themselves right. in a way, very similar to how you were. Right. It's a reason those players that we idolize are who they are because that's what they, you know, it's like, for instance, if someone wants to come lead, they want to be Al Larson. No, it's a reason he's who he is. You know, it's good that you want to be like him, but understand what your game is. And, and understand that they draft you and teams want you, whether they draft you or they trade for you, because they like some they like something about your game that you have already. And you may need to add, like for me, I add I put on more strength. You know, as people can see my old my pictures when I was playing and maybe I put on a lot of muscle mass. And I also and I was able to uh add my three point shot. You know, so but I didn't I didn't wanna as like Isaiah Thomas is my idol, I didn't wanna do all the things Isaiah Thomas do because that's not who I am. Yeah. No, there's a comment that I saw and I just want, I kind of just want you to correct him because I feel like if you don't know, you don't know. Someone right. was saying street ball is easy, NBA is different, but street ball in its own way needs the respect. Well, one thing about street ball is some of the fans have a different feel and thought about street ball. Right? Mm -hmm. Some people just think street ball is what we use, what a lot of us did on and one and that's not street ball. Yeah. Right. When we talk about street ball in the inner city, we talk about tough basketball tournaments, basketball leagues, tough leagues in the playgrounds in these tough environments or areas. And trust me, I've seen a lot of NBA guys play, try to come out there and play street ball. And it's just a total different environment. It's not that their game didn't measure up. Obviously, they gained it, but the environment could could uh, could distract them from going out there to do all the things that they're capable of doing. So when we talk about street ball, you're talking about street ball in the sense that, you know, it's not just about the game. It's a lot of things that come along with that area that that game is in. Uh, like, so for me, when I went to college and played the pros, some of the things that fans would say, I was, I, it didn't bother me because I've heard some of the worst things as a child growing yeah. up playing street ball in New York City. As a, I'm, I'm talking about at 10, 11, 12 years old, I've heard some of the worst things in the world that, the things people were saying to the fans and in the stands and in the NBA didn't even bother me. Yeah, someone saying streetball prepares you for the NBA toughness. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, it, it definitely streetball definitely prepares you for the toughness. Uh, and like I said, streetball like I'm talking about the streetball in the inner cities like you know New York, Detroit, the LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. you know Washington D.C. You know you talking about some big time talent with a lot with I mean you have to be tough. If some of my stars is from playing outside in the park. Like none of my stars are really from playing in inside the gym. And that's what I'm talking about. It's like you have to be prepared for all that stuff. Mm hmm I was gonna ask, what do you think was one of the most challenging obstacles for you to overcome to get where you were today? Do you think a lot of that came through playing street ball or was that kind of coming up through the MBA and having to overcome all of that adversity? One of the most challenging obstacles was, was uh, for me is having coaches understand that I'm far from the street ball stigma that was attached to me. From, mm. from you know, they had no idea that I can run a team, I can defend the ball, I know how to pass the ball, I know uh, you know how to throw post passes. I just they, when 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 a lot of coaches had a chance to coach me and really be around me it blew their mind that there's, there's not much you had to teach me, you know, from a, from a lead guard standpoint. There's not much they had to teach me. You know, the only thing they, I had to understand was that, I mean, that they wanted me to do is like understand that I don't have to hit the home run pass all the time. And, when they, and what we mean by home run is the fancy pass, you know. And that's something that was embedded in me since I was a kid, that, that just the love and the flair for the game. So, you know, and that's the only thing they, they, I had to tone down. But other than that, it's not much they had to teach me. It was just for them to understand that I was far from this playground 
basketball player that they all thought I was. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest, so, so the answer, the biggest intelligence really wasn't for me. It was really for them to understand who, who, uh, how I really was and therefore would make my adjustment easy by, by them allowing me to go out there and lead their team and run their team and run their organization. That's actually a good point that it's more on them than it was on you. Right. right. But, Which is, I, no, I feel like that usually isn't the case. I feel like everyone always takes it on them. Right. As opposed to looking at their coaches like, no, you're here to like, help me. <laughs> like, and for me to like, help you. Help me help you. It's yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's weird because you see a lot of players on some of these teams and that can play ball. And it's like, well, when are they going to get the opportunity to go out there and show that, you know, they can help this team? Yeah. And it's tough. Like I said, it's tough. The NBA is, is tough. Only but so many people can play at one time. And mm -hmm. you have rotations. You got guys paid a lot of money. So you got a guy that can help you. But we got to find out why this other player is paid so much money that we have to get him out there. So it's so many different dynamics for the NBA that, you know, a lot of fans won't understand and know about. Yeah, definitely. We're all going to take a few more questions. So if you guys have questions, please send them in. Someone I know is asking, who do you think is the most underrated Magic player? Wow. The most underrated Magic player to me is, uh, is I would go with Ross, Terrence Ross. Um, Human Torch. Yeah, I would think he's under is underrated because uh, uh, I think because his consistency uh, over the last years, you know, people still haven't given him his just due, and he's been overshadowed by another great player. Who I mean, unfortunately, we, they had to trade, you know, for, you know, for future, and that's Vucevic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then he was overshadowed also by the year that uh, Fournier was having as well. You know, those those are two big pieces for Atlanta that. You know, obviously they had the deal because of future reasons, and you know these guys were playing at a high level. So sometimes a guy under a guy like Ross gets overshadowed and you know underappreciated, appreciated, you know by not by really Atlanta but by the NBA uh, uh, people. Yeah, he's such a great sixth man, and I don't think right. he's part of that conversation enough. So completely, I, and it's so crazy. You. you know, when you have great sixth men, that they let you know he can start on at least twenty five other teams. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so when you got a guy like that, he can definitely start on 25 other teams. Yeah, definitely. Someone wants to know who's the funniest. I don't know if they meant funniest or just funnest. But so, someone said, who is the funniest person you know during your time with the Magic? Funniest person I know. Well, there was quite a few of them. So Dwight, you know, this is Dwight. When Dwight was in Orlando, Dwight yeah. was the greatest I mean, you look forward every day to come to that, come to that gym and just be around him. He was just a happy-go-lucky young young kid. That, you know, he made he brought a smile to all of our faces every day. Uh, he was funny. Another guy that you know he didn't get a lot of playing time when I was there because of the, he was so we were, I had a lot of guard. The funny guy was Tyron Lou. You know, Coach Lou. Now he's Coach Lou. Coach Lou was funny. Coach Lou because he's been around uh, the Shacks and the and all the stuff that LA's won championships and he was hilarious. Uh, and believe it or not, um, um, Coach Van Gundy is funny. It's, it's, yeah, I know on the sideline, people think he has this scowl on his face. He's, he's always upset. But to be honest with you, one of the, has a, the greatest sense of humor and one of the funniest guys I've, I've been around as a coach. I love it. I feel like that's how a lot of coaches are. Once you, like, get them to, like, take their walls down, it's like, oh, you're actually, like, really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love it. Let's see what, what we got for our last few questions. Someone wants to know, what did you think of the crowd when the Magic knocked out, knocked Cleveland off out of the finals, for the finals? To be honest with you, the crowd was better. Uh, was a lot, I think it was louder when we knocked Boston out. I think the crowd was louder when we knocked Boston out. The Cleveland series, they were loud. It was raucous. Um, but... A lot of people don't really understand that the dynamic of that series that that series wasn't as hard for us <laughs> as as the the, the uh, semifinal was. Uh, we could have easily beat them uh, four zero, right? If, mm -hmm. if LeBron if LeBron James doesn't make that shot in game two, they're swept. You know what I'm saying? So the 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 the, the, magic, the, the Cleveland series was you know it's not that they weren't good. 
we were a better team and it wasn't harder. The, 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 the Boston series was harder for us because we had to go seven games and we had to win it in Boston. And every game that we had at home against the, the Boston Celtics was, you, it was definite in that. Uh, mm -hmm. Cleveland, you know, Cleveland was definitely a great series. And, and the one person I miss the most, even till this day, I wish, I know she's older now, is the young lady used to always sing the national anthem. Uh, we made we made sure that she sang every national anthem because we always won <laughs> when she sang the national anthem. Uh, I can't I can't think of a name. Though. Hey, she, if it works. She was so wonderful, uh, and we knew it. And I mean, I remember one time they asked us, "Do you do we like her to keep doing it?" I'm like, yeah, let her keep singing. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Actually, so there's a question, and I actually love this question. Tina. So they want to know what player gave you your welcome to the league moment. A few. I got welcome to the league in practice. Uh, Sam Cassell. I mean, he was. Oh, uh, Gina. Gina Marie Gina. was her name. Yep, Gina Marie. Uh, if anyone sees Gina Marie, tell her. Ray Falls says hello. But practice, Sam Cassell, like, he would pull up, hit these pull up jumpers, pump fake, take me in the post. So he welcomed me. And then um, one game I got in the game, and I used to always like to, like, you know, growing up, you like to, you know, finger roll. A lot of kids go with jelly nowadays and all that. And one time I tried to. Uh, I tried to uh, lay the ball up and, and turn my dice through the block my shot into like the fifth row, and I, that's when I realized, oh, I'm playing. I'm playing with the big boys here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Those are. I feel like that's always such a fun question to ask because it's always so completely different for everybody, and especially for someone like you. Like I said, having played street ball and then coming into the league, they're two very different animals. Oh, listen, it's, it's bigger, stronger, faster. Uh, players um, in shape dedicated uh, on their bodies and so those are the one thing I've learned excuse me over the years uh you know the difference big difference street ball and playing the NBA you're playing against some of the best athletes in the world uh, night in night out mm -hmm. what would be final question what would be advice that you would give to either someone who wants to be in the league now or even just the younger guys who are in the league because it is a lot different than your time there because it's ever evolving, but it's still competitive and you are seeing such young guys play now. What the advice I give the young guys in the league right now is, is you know, the advice that they give us. Well, I was gonna, don't get too high, don't get too low and down on yourself. It's a long season and take care of your body, right? Take care of your body, take care of the little nick, the nagging injuries. Uh, and, and understand that you, 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 you're going against perennial all-stars and some future Hall of Famers that mm -hmm. uh, understand that you're playing against the best basketball players, some of the best basketball players, if not the best basketball, basketball players in the world, you know, on a, on a nightly basis. So it's, it's, it's going to be some, some good months, some bad months, some good weeks, some bad weeks. You just got to, you got to hold it all together and, and, and understand every day out there is a learning experience. That's one thing about the NBA is that you're always going to learn Every night, you're learning about who you're playing against. You're learning about what the other team is trying to do to you and your team, right? So, you know, you got to each night figure out the best way to get your shot because different defenses, you know, you can see it's a lot thrown at you. At a young mm -hmm. and, and so that's what, for those guys that's in the league. Guys that want to be in the league, one is continue to work hard, continue to work on your weaknesses, work on your strength. Uh, and one thing for sure, two things for certain is you got to stay in clear trouble. One thing this young guy that's trying to get to the NBA is you don't want to have this background where uh, you have this long rap sheet of them not being coachable or you're getting this, getting into trouble off the floor or, you know, you, you, you're just a head case. You, you want to stand clear of those things so it gives you a greatest opportunity to make it in the NBA. Um, you know, so those are the things I would tell the guys that's trying to get into the league. That is a great answer. I love that. I know I keep saying last question, but you oh, just no. you just had so Bye. many good players during your time in the league. And someone wants to know, who was someone that you looked forward to playing against? Uh, I look forward to playing against a lot of them every night. Uh, but mainly from a point guard standpoint, uh, Allen Iverson, then my childhood buddy, Stephon Marbury. I love that. that I mean, him and I have battled each other since we were young kids. So, um all, all, all the point guards. I look forward to playing against them every night. And then you obviously um, get a chance to see some of the guys that you you, you watch just battle uh, when you're a young kid watching them. So I got a chance to play against Michael Jordan, which was like a, 
a fantasy dream come true when he was with the Wizards. Um, you know, a lot of stars I got a chance to play against, but mainly from a point guard standpoint, just playing against some of your peers that, you know, were that had this big name and that you actually watched come up in the game of basketball. Uh, you know, I remember being 15 years old, going down to uh, Virginia, playing against Allen Ice when we were 15 years old, and him and I were going at each other, and all of a sudden we see each other down the line in the NBA. So um, a lot of these young kids right now that you see playing basketball in the AAU sports, is I had to tell them, it's not it's not coincidence that a lot of you are going to see each other the rest of your lives when we mm-hmm. keep up the ranks and trying to make it to the NBA. You're going to see each other because the best going to see the best. The best will play against the best. Yeah. I know I asked you the reverse of this, but someone wants to know who was the toughest person for you to defend. I had, I had quite a few, um, but I had I could defend them in different areas. So obviously, Alan Lawrence was the toughest for me because every play down for him, every play down, every play coming down the court for the Sixers was for him. Mm-hmm. So the rest of my team could could rest a little bit because no one they weren't they weren't going to give the ball to their man to run and to score. They they kept coming at me all night long. So. That's that that made him tough to guard because it was not a every time you play you it's not one second on that court you getting a break on defense. The other toughest uh, players for me to guard were big strong guards, uh, the Baron Davis types, the Chauncey Bill because not only can they take you off the dribble with they with their moves and stuff, they, they were big and stronger to put me in the low block. So I was happy most nights that they didn't post, they, they, their team didn't run post up plays, but I'm like yes, <laughs> guarded the post, but. You know, those guys are difficult to guard because their ability to take you from the outside and their ability to put you in the, the post, you know, to, to, to get you a foul trouble. That's fine. Ooh, someone wants to know, did you have a pregame ritual? Oh, man, a pregame. That's my, I think I just saw, that's my friend Peanut. Uh, actually, Peanut used to work with the match. I don't know if he still does. So I, it's, I had a weirdest pregame ritual, all right, because I wasn't. All right, let's I, hear it. I wasn't a big sleeper at night. Okay, I, I I give y'all this because you know my career is over. But I was a, a, a night guy, <laughs> you know. So even when I, even in Orlando, I used to I was a night person. So my pregame ritual, uh, I would drink three cups of coffee right before the game. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so and then so one time, Coach Van Gundy, I'm just flying up and down the court. You know, I'm flying, I'm fast breaking, I'm flying, and he's like, "Would you slow down?" And then during uh, and then uh, at halftime, he's he coach. Coach Van Gundy goes, "Skip, would you lay off the coffee?" <laughs> Are you just drinking it like straight up, like black? No, no, no. I'll put cream and sugar. All right. Yeah, that's what you need is more sugar with three cups of coffee before a game. <laughs> I don't know. I just developed that ritual over the years. I, I figured, I figured, like, I was such a night person. Man, so when were you getting sleep? <laughs> I take naps. So during the during the day, I'm, I'm a nap. I'm, a, I'm like a baby. I, I would nap every day. I nap before a game. I nap all the time. I was a nap person. So you were just doing like shoot around, like get back to like either your house or the room, nap, get oh, to I'm the not- arena, pound coffee, and then just hit the court. So like, it became a ritual for me, but I didn't really need it because I took long naps. Like, yeah, I, I could sleep in the daytime like four hours. That is crazy. So I need to know. So were you drinking these? Like, were you drinking coffee before you were doing your warm up? Like before you were doing shooting? Or were you doing this like right before you guys took the court? I went to the arena. So if it's a seven o'clock game, I'm in the arena at five. Okay. Warm up. I get stretched out. I I, I warm my feet up. uh, Put my feet like the hot, the the hot uh, tub. uh, And let you know me my ankles and feet. Yeah. And while I'm there, I might drink the coffee. I drink the coffee. That's one. Then when I'm getting my ankles taped, I'm getting my ankles taped, putting my uniform, that's two. You know, and so it, they're not big cups. They're like the little, little, little styrofoam, little small, little Dixie cup, like real small white cups. Like they're not like the cups that, you know, you would, yeah. like a Starbucks small. They're not just like, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't, that, it wasn't like that. So oh like three of them, God. might get you one and a half. Okay, so, that's fair. But those three cups might equal one and a half cups because they're so they were like small cups of coffee. Yeah, that's still so crazy. And you never crashed at all. Ah, mm. that's impressive. That's because very so, impressive. <laughs> like I said, I really didn't need it. That I did it one day, and I had a great game. So I was like, oh, <laughs> so that's how rituals are developed. Yeah. So 
people develop it because they did something and it they had a good game. Like I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna do it again. And it just stuck with me my career. I love it. Someone said skip to my macchiato. <laughs> Okay. Are you still a coffee drinker to this day? Uh, not, not like that. Not like that. That's fair. I was going to say more, three cups at... Whew. I'm, more, I'm more of a tea guy now. <laughs> I respect that. Yeah, I'm more of a tea, a tea person. I definitely respect that. I know a lot of people are asking, what is happening right now? This is our virtual happy hour presented by McUltra. We're actually getting very close to wrapping up because the Orlando Magic are taking on the Charlotte Hornets tonight, which you can catch all that action on Valley Sports Florida. So Dante, Jeff, David, they're all going to have it for you as you got, we get ready for this game tonight. It should be a good one. Of course, a lot of young action is going to be at work tonight for the Orlando Magic. Very exciting. Guys like Cole, RJ Hampton, as well yeah. as many others. They got, they got a good future, especially in the backcourt. They have a good future, bright future. Uh, excuse me. Obviously, pick up some pieces. Uh, they fill out the roster. You know, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, to me, it's going to be interesting going to next year to see what happens and who they, you know, what pieces they bring in to help, help mm -hmm. the young the young guys and it's the sky's the sky is the limit for them i'm telling you yeah the sky's well especially they're getting guys like markel back they'll get jonathan isaac back who are two those huge are so, instrumental those, pieces those, those guys you know when my those they were big pieces coming yeah it's the one thing about them is i would love for them to see them not be so so injury prone and you mm -hmm. know so every year you hurt it's tough it's tough it's gonna be tough for them to reach their full potential you know, because teams now start to back off them because of the fact that every year they're hurt, they're hurt, they're hurt. So, you know, for them, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope they can get these injuries under control and, and get out there because those are some phenomenal. That's phenomenal talent right there, uh, Fultz and uh, uh, Isaac. Yeah, definitely. One question that I saw, and I wanted to ask this and said I asked your top five from Orlando Magic all time, but being from New York and New York, especially in the city, like. There's some big names that have come out of New York in terms of the basketball world. Who would you say are your top five New York guys? Uh, my top five New York guys. I will, I'll leave myself off the list because I, you know, I, I will, I'll throw myself in there. But I will go Kenny Anderson, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Stephon Marbury. Uh, so many. A lot. There's a lot. Man, there's so many. Because you can't. It's, it's hard. It's hard to say. But those three, I can name those off the bat. Uh, I'm trying to think who else I could uh, pull out there. Um, because remember, this 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 basketball thing in New York is going back. Even like Bob Cousy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob Cousy was one of the best guys. I mean, best player in the club in New, New York. It's so many. It's it's hard to pick a five. To come out of there, um, wow, oh, wow, woo! Ooh, I, I put Mark Jackson in there because of how long his career was. So that's I put Mark. That's four. And um, ooh man, it's tough. Man. I'm torn between the last one because there's so many of them that 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 you know just blows your mind, blows you away. You know with their career. Um, I can go with Pearl Washington, I can go with Rod Strickland, I can go with uh, uh, so many. And put it like this, we're going to have, it's more guard because we're guard heavy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's going to be a guard. Uh, but I, I, I would throw Rod Strickland in it. I would throw Rod Strickland in my five. All right. Yeah. I, it's always great talking to I the guys. No particular order and no, no, uh, you know, not by position, you know, because obviously we have to do position that'll be different. You know, I would, I would throw Connie Hawkins and all those guys in there. You know, that's another name I left off, Connie Hawkins. Uh, but that's a tough list to, 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 to come up with. But I would definitely put the guards on there. Yeah. You're going to think of, you're gonna think about this in an hour and some name is going to pop in your head. You're going to be like, oh, I can't believe I didn't say that. I see a lot of people typing in about the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody said Nate, Nate Archibald. Yeah, Nate Archibald. Yeah. yeah. There's, so, there's so many. And I'm sure it's not stopping anytime soon. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it, it, we, we, 
We took a dip here. There was, yeah, there was a there was a little quiet. There was a bit of a quiet time, but it's coming back. Yeah. It's coming back. But Rafer, I so much appreciate you taking your time out of your Friday to join me on this virtual happy hour presented by Mick Ultra. It was an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Anytime. Anytime you want me to come on, just I'm just a phone call away. Uh, anytime. Great. Thank you guys again for so much for tuning into our Instagram live and our virtual happy hour presented by Mick Ultra. I want to remind you that you can go to drizzly.com and get $5 off your order by using the code Ultra Magic. So make sure you go ahead and do that. Orlando Magic getting ready to take on the Charlotte Hornets tonight. You can catch all the action on Valley Sports Twitter with pregame coverage beginning in just 30 minutes. So make sure you tune in. It will be a great game. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone. And again, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.